We're in Luke chapter 22 this morning. As we are approaching the cross today in our text, this text that is before us, we will observe the Lord's agonizing struggle. The struggle that took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. And beloved, I will admit to you, there's no possible way for me to relay to you, for us to fully comprehend all that the Lord Jesus endured in the night of His betrayal. As the weight of the cross the weight of the sins of the world, the weight of the wrath and justice of a holy God was bearing down upon Him. The Lord Jesus in the garden was driven to prayer. I would have loved to have been able to just say, all right, everybody, let's hop on the plane. Let's go to, let's go to Israel. Let's have this service in the garden that's pictured behind me. That's as good as I could do, though. I couldn't afford the plane tickets for everybody. So you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit and kind of just dismiss all of these things around us. And we're, we're sitting here, we're in the garden. This is a real place. This really took place 2,000 years ago. This event unfolded. And there were those who were with Jesus on the night of His betrayal. In the accounts of the Gospel writers, we see the humanity of Christ as well as the deity of the Lord Jesus. This section of text, it's not here before us for our enjoyment. This text is not for our life enhancement. The sermon is not for three tips on how to have better prayer lives in the gardens of our lives. Not at all. We're approaching holy ground. And just as Moses approached In the Old Testament, the bush that was burning. And the Lord said, take off your shoes, Moses. We would do well to take off our shoes in this holy ground. And I don't mean taking off the shoes of your feet. You understand what I'm saying. In this sermon, my aim is to glorify the Lord Jesus by faithfully showing Christ in all of His beauty as He related to the Father in heaven, as He related to His disciples, and even how the Lord Jesus related to His enemies. Now let us see our Savior as we hear the word of the Lord. Luke 22, beginning in verse 39. Coming out, He went to the Mount of Olives, as He was accustomed. And His disciples also followed Him. When He came to the place, He said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude... And he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour. And the power of darkness. Let us pray. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who loved the church and gave himself for her. 
We know, Lord, the purpose of Christ's life and his death and his resurrection, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, and that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So, Lord, wash over your church now by your word and cleanse us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In our text today, we see two opposing leaders. We see two opposing agendas. We see two opposing purposes for life unfold here. What do we learn about God the Father? What do we learn about Jesus Messiah? And what do we learn about fallen humanity from this text? I'm going to set forth a proposition and then we're going to unpack the text and then we'll make an uh, application at the end. There's three truths that stand out in this text and I want these to be set in our minds because what we believe determines our behavior. What you believe about God determines how you live. It determines how I live. What you believe about the second coming, what you believe about sin, what you believe about hell, what you believe about heaven, that determines your behavior. And so if you look at your behavior, go backwards, look at your behavior, it tells you what you believe. You can go either way with this. What you believe determines your behavior. Look back over the last week, how I've behaved, that tells me what I believe. So what do we see in this text? We see, first of all, that God is completely sovereign. Not one moment, not one turn of events happens outside of God's good plan. And we see this in the text today. Not only do we see that God is completely sovereign, but we also see that Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, is completely submitted to the Father. We see this in the text. Jesus, fully God, fully man, and His will is submitted to the will of His Father. And we also see that man, and I'm speaking of humanity, is wicked, fallen, and totally depraved. And we are in desperate need of a Savior. It's the total depravity of man. We see on display here even religious men who are self-righteous. The best of the best are the worst of the worst. And we see this unfold. So let's make some observations in this text. We're going to break it down. The two sections that we have looked at, verse, uh, verses 39 to 46, we see the agony of Jesus. The agony of Jesus in prayer. We observe his agony. Now, I've just formulated my thoughts as we go through this section. And I don't know if it's helpful to you or not as you take notes and however you jot things down. But they just all kind of fall under the letter P, all right? So first of all, we see the place, all right? The place of prayer in verse 39. There's a place coming out. He went to the Mount of Olives. Where is your place for prayer? Jesus' place was the garden. It was the Garden of Gethsemane. It reminds us of another garden in Scripture. Back in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, where God created man. He set him in the garden, and He gave him the responsibility to care for the garden. And He said, I will provide for you, and we'll have fellowship together, and I'll come and I'll walk with you in the cool of the day. You'll have everything you need, all the enjoyment, all the fellowship, the fellowship that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit have had for all eternity. Let's, let's share that with you. But don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's one tree. Don't eat of that tree. And in that garden, Genesis 3, Eve was tempted. She was deceived. And Adam willingly disobeyed. And we lost the fellowship. We were put out of the garden. So isn't it fitting that we go back to a garden? Do you understand that there's more going on than just this nice little place that Jesus found? We're back in a garden and this is the one sent to reverse the curse from the first garden. That's why the Old Testament, we see Christ concealed. And in the New Testament, Christ is revealed. And Jesus is in the garden. He's in this place. But we also see a pattern for prayer. We see that at the end of verse 39. There's not just a place, but there's a pattern. He was accustomed to this. And his disciples followed him when he came to the place. Okay? So there's a place. He goes to this place. The disciples know where they're going. They're following him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, here Jesus loved to be alone with his Father. He loved to be in fellowship. We saw that in the end of Luke chapter 21, verse 37. And in the daytime, he was teaching in the temple. But at night, he went out and stayed on the mountain called Olivet. Before every major decision... 
Before every major event in Jesus' public ministry, there was a priority that he placed upon prayer. He got alone with God. He prayed all night before he chose the 12 apostles. Prayer was simply a way of life for Jesus. And we see the disciples here. They're tagging along now. They're following. It's reminiscent of the call. Do you remember the call that he gave to them? Follow me. Come follow me. And if you're going to follow me, you have to lay down. You have to die to you. You can't follow me and you at the same time. There's nothing changed about that call. Beloved. If you're going to follow, if I'm going to follow Jesus, I have to die to me. Because the old me, selfish me, wants to crawl up on that throne every day, every minute of the day. And I have to recognize that. Well, the disciples are still following him, but they had no idea where they're going. They had no idea what's going on. They can't even begin to comprehend all that is about to take place. They are living in a fog. Okay? What is that? That's descriptive of life that is prayerless. If we are not a praying people, we are living in a fog spiritually. We're operating by sight, not by faith. That's these disciples. And what a vivid illustration they are for us of the danger of living this way. They were following Jesus, but not in the way that a person follows him when they take up their cross. Now, Judas, one of the disciples, he's no longer following him. He's doing his own thing. He's had enough. All of his dreams and opinions and plans and all of his, you know, angst that Jesus wasn't doing for him what he wanted him to do. He's a false convert. Beloved, can I help you with this? When people continue over even decades to have a selfish will upon the church, they're reminiscent of Judas. His plan was not the Lord's plan. His plan was his plan. And Jesus said, no, your plan's not going to work. Leave her alone. She's anointed me forever. They're going to be talking about her. Judas, they're going to be talking about you too. It's not going to be in the same way. Judas is left. He's doing his own thing. He's not following him anymore. But Judas knew where he could go to find Jesus. He said, I don't know where to find him. I know where he goes. Doesn't it sound like Daniel in the Old Testament? They tried to find something against him. They couldn't find anything against him except, you know what? We're going to have to go to the area of his worship of his God. Every morning, every afternoon, he goes home for lunch. Every evening, three times a day, he's praying. He's praying. He faces toward Jerusalem. He opens up those windows. If we're going to find him guilty of anything, it's going to be, it's going to be between, because he, he's got integrity. He's got character. He doesn't do anything wrong that we can see. They weren't claiming that he was sinless, but they knew they couldn't find anything that would stick against him. John recorded in his gospel, go there with me, John chapter 18. And I want you to put something in there if you have a little way to bookmark John 18, because we'll be back there. John 18, verses 1 and 2, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron. And that's just drawing a picture. It's going all the way back to David. When David was run out of his kingdom, Absalom uh, usurped the throne. And, and David leaves with his, his band of followers and they cross over the brook, the, the brook Kidron. He's been betrayed by his own family member. We see this connection here. That Jesus goes out with his disciples over the brook Kidron where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. He loved to be there. So we see that this pattern, it wasn't when, oh, everything's going wrong. Uh, quick, call a prayer meeting. No. Jesus' life was marked by faithful prayer. We see in verse 40 the prompt. Jesus gives a prompt to pray. He's giving instruction to his disciples. He's, he's warning them. He's commanding them to pray. When he came to the place, he said to them in verse 40, Luke 22, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Jesus warned his men. What's coming is terrible and it's awful temptation. Pray. Pray. Be in prayer. Our only hope of victory over temptation is to prayerfully stand in obedience to the word of God. So Jesus gives them a prompt. He says, I want you guys to pray. All right? And then he leaves them and he goes further into the garden. He goes about a stone's throw away and we see privacy. 
Right? That's important. So wouldn't you expect to see this when Jesus said, when you pray, go into the closet, go into the secret place. Right? Enough of the public prayers that are flowery and filled with thous and thus and all of those things. How about you get alone with God and seek him and seek him when no one's looking and let him reward you when everyone is looking. Many times we have it flip-flopped. We'll all serve when everyone is looking. But if no one cares and no one notices, well, hang it up. Not so with Jesus. He practices what he preaches. So we need to observe this, this privacy. And he was withdrawn from them, verse 41 says, about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed. In Mark's gospel, we learn that Jesus left all of his disciples, most of them at the entrance of the garden, and he only took Peter, James, and John further uh, to where he was. And he's just troubled and deeply distre distressed. Not only do we see this, this prompt that he gives to the disciples, and he, he goes, Jesus goes in privacy to prayer, but then we see in verse 42 this petition. What is the petition that Jesus gives to his father, he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. What do we see in this petition? What do we see in this request that Jesus brings before the father? Jesus was not in a hurry to die. We see his humanity here. He didn't face death with some kind of unrealistic attitude of glee. He wasn't like what we see in jihadists. I'm going to die and I'm going to take people out in hate. He knew what lay ahead of him. And so he asked his father, let this cup be taken. If there's any other way to accomplish this, let this cup pass from me. You see his humanity? That's helpful to us because we'll go through trials. And if Jesus just boldly went into it, it didn't matter was no big deal. How would that be comforting to us? When we face death, when we face, and all around the world today, our brothers and sisters are suffering for the sake of the gospel. Their heads are being cut off. They're being burned alive. Oh, how that should temper how we view the church and how we view the gospel and how we view one another as we're commanded to remember them as if chained with them. Jesus is praying and he's, he's anticipating the cup. What is the cup? It's a cup of divine wrath. It's often spoke of, spoken of by the Old Testament prophets that God's wrath must be satisfied, not because he, he's an angry ogre, not because he's just an upset person without cause, but because he is holy and he's just. And he's righteous. Jesus in his humanity was not looking forward to drinking this cup, but he was willing. Listen to the warning about the waiting cup for those who reject Jesus Christ and refuse to worship him alone. And especially in this time of tribulation from Revelation 14. And I'll begin in verse 10. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name." Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Do you hear what is described there? Does that not cause us to look at those who are in our family and in our workplace and in our school with a little bit more sobriety? of what awaits every person who dies without Christ? Does that not motivate us to prayerfully submit our checkbook to the Lord and His plan to advance the gospel in every aspect of our lives? We see at the end of verse 42 that Jesus grants permission. 
He gives permission. I remember growing up, I went down to Great Lakes Naval Base. And I don't know if some of you have served in the Navy, but I would go with uh, various sailors and we had ministry that, and when they would have to go into their uh, quarters, they would come to the person, you know, at the arms, the person at the desk, and they would have to salute and say, permission to come aboard. I always thought that was cool. And they would never let me in. I couldn't go in there because I wasn't part of the Navy. I just have to stand outside and wait. But they couldn't just walk in. They had to stop, salute, permission to come aboard, and then the permission's granted. All right? There's this submission. You can't just do what you want to do. This is military. People die when you just do what you want to do. We're together in this. We need one another. And Jesus, He grants permission. He says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Here we see the submission of the Savior. It allowed Him to willingly drink the cup. Reminds me of the hymn, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have Thine Own Way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after Thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. You, see, you hear the submission there. J.C. Ryle, he writes of this submission. I, find it, I found it helpful and perhaps you will as well. He says this, he says, Submission of the will, like this, is one of the brightest graces which can adorn the Christian character. It is one which a child of God ought to aim at in everything if he desires to be like Christ. But at no time is such submission of will so needful as in the day of sorrow. And in nothing does it shine so brightly as in a believer's prayers for relief. He who can say from his heart, when a bitter cup is before him, not my will, but thine be done, has reached a high position in the school of God. Permission. Not my will. Yours be done. You see in verse 40, 43, power. There's power that comes through prayer. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, just as they did after the temptation. Matthew 4.11, and angels came and ministered to him. He yielded himself to the Father, and the Father supplied his need. In verse 44, we see the persistence in prayer. He didn't quit. He didn't give up. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly then his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. And Luke is the only one who gives to us this account, but he's the doctor. He's concerned about this. This matters to him. This is important to him. The physical change that took place in Jesus, this strain, this stress, that his blood was mingled with his sweat. You know, I, I had to think to myself, I, I've never prayed like this. I've never been so moved like this in prayer. And this is how Jesus is, is battling through prayer and temptation and the weight of the world. And he is God and he knows it all. And he knows all that will take place. He knows of his disciples. He knows Judas is coming. He knows about you. He knows about me. He knows about the cross. He's God. And so the full weight, I don't feel the full weight of sin. I don't feel the full weight. I can't know and I can't look into hell and see people that I could have witnessed to and I didn't. I don't see them there. But if they died without Christ, that is where they are forever and ever and ever and ever. Jesus, God in flesh, felt the full weight and his sweat carried out blood. He is praying for you and for me and for his men and for strength. I believe the writer of Hebrews picks up on this imagery when he addressed the believers who are struggling against sin and temptation. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 3 and 4. The writer says this, he says, For consider him, and he's speaking of Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Now listen to this. Verse 4. You have not yet resisted to 
bloodshed, striving against sin. Ah, that's what Jesus is doing in the garden. He is resisting sin. And it's not others shedding his blood. That's how much prayer and earnestness went into his prayer life, standing against the full weight of hell there in the garden. But Paul writes this to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 12 and 13. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful. But God is faithful. Did you hear that, beloved? God is what? Faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Do you understand that there's no temptation that you as a child of God have to sin? Do you understand this? Can I help us with something? Please don't say any more when somebody's going through a difficult time? Well, you know, the Lord will never give you more than you can handle. That's not what the text is saying. They chopped Paul's head off. That was more than he could handle. Okay? That is just like Christianese nice things we say to try to comfort people. We don't have a clue what to say to them, and we probably shouldn't say anything. Are you with me? Okay? He's saying here, you do not have to sin. So when they are coming to you and they are clothed in black and you're wearing orange and you're kneeling on a beach and their knife is approaching your neck, you have a way out. And it's going from a sandy beach next to water that will be carrying your blood to the presence of Christ. That's your way out. But you don't have to deny Christ. You can die putting out in the audio that goes into a track that's published throughout the Muslim world. Two weeks later, people are reading about Yeshua. There's your way of escape. Because Jesus conquered death. And he resisted all sin. And his blood was shed. That's what is the message here. We don't have to sin. We don't have to say after we sin, well, you know, I'm just a man. <laughs> Knock it off. That's sin. Stop saying that. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Have you really resisted? Have you really resist, resisted sexual temptation till your blood was being shed out of your sweat, sweating blood out because you resisted that much? Pride? Selfishness? Arrogance in a, in a dispute with your husband, wife? You resisted and, and you started bleeding because you were resisting the temptation to be arrogant and selfish. You really resisted? No, we haven't. We haven't. But Jesus did. And that's good news for us. That's really good news. Look at what we see in verses 45 and 46. Patience. Patience. Patience is the fruit of prayer. When he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise up and pray, lest you enter temptation. If you don't care about me, you should care about you. You're coming into temptation. You don't care what's happening to me. You're all sleeping. Listen, beloved. If this sermon doesn't wake you up, Better do a spiritual evaluation. You know, if we're just so drowsy that we can't focus on Christ in this, then we find ourselves in the places of the disciples and they were headed for disaster in a real short time and they didn't know it. And they weren't listening. They were drowsy. Now I know what it is to fall asleep. I fell asleep when I was a freshman in college going back, driving through Illinois from Wisconsin back to school. Driving my little Celica, Michael W. Smith playing in the cassette tape, you know. 
It's freezing cold like it is, you know, in this weather right now. Rich was sleeping next to me so comfortably in the passenger seat. I'm driving, being serenaded, you know. I just remember, like, just setting my head back on the headrest, like, just, just, in Illinois, straight as an arrow road for miles and miles and miles. Nice wide open freeway. Eyes closed, and the next thing I knew was a Yugo was in front of me. Bam! I hit it. I wake up, Yugo is right out in the middle of the grassy area, you know, and I'm paralyzed in the seat. Rich wakes up, like, what are you doing? Are you going to pull over? I'm like, yeah, it's probably a good idea. Pull over. <laughs> The Illinois State Trooper gave me a ticket for following too closely. <laughs> That's what you could say, yeah. I was too close. My front end bore testimony then, so did the totaled Yugo. The frightened lady trying to, I tried to help her attach her muffler exhaust back to the bumper while she drove to wherever she was going. What a wake up. That was horrible. I don't know if you've ever fallen asleep like that, but good grief, I had nightmares of that for some time after. I'd be sleeping and like, oh, I'm, dri oh, I'm not driving. I'm in my bed. I'm all right. I'm okay. I'm good. See, the other, the other gospels record that Jesus went back multiple times to the disciples. He wait, wait, wake up, guys. Let's pray. He'd go back and pray. Come back. Guys, you're sleeping. Wake up. They're, they're just so tired. They're just so heavy with sorrow. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what's taking place. In Mark 14, verse 38, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And in verse 37, it says, could you not watch one hour? Could we not clear one hour this week in our prayer lives to say, God, what do you want me to do? Can we not clear Wednesday, 6.30 p.m., and gather and pray for one hour? For some of us, that is so hard to do, just like it was for the disciples. Could we not watch with Him and lift up the suffering brothers and sisters that we have in the world today? Are we too busy to remember them? Well, that's the agony of Jesus. What about the arrival of Judas? Judas. Verses 47 to 53, Judas shows up. He's got a, a, dis, a, a detachment of troops, probably estimates of up to 600 men have come to the garden. Can you, can you picture this? This whole mob, you know, knives, swords, torches. Here they come. They got clubs. They're coming after Jesus. Behold the traitor, verse 47. And while he was still speaking, behold a multitude. And he who was called Judas, one of the 12, went up before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. Jesus had prepared his men for this night. He had told them, I will be betrayed. The Son of Man will be betrayed. They haven't been listening. It's their own fault. Beloved, there are some in our congregation. Temptation is knocking on their door. And they're not listening. There are some who have been in fellowship, who have been taken out of fellowship by the wicked one because they didn't think they could fall or they didn't think their errant ideas or what they found on the internet would really, you know, be that big of a deal. Jesus prepared them. They weren't listening. It's their own fault they aren't ready to stand in this hour of testing. John's account declares the comp complete control of Jesus. Are you there still in John 18? He gives us a little behind the scenes. John's concerned with showing forth Jesus as, as God in flesh, the deity of Christ. Look at verse 3. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Do you understand what Jesus is doing here? This mob comes and we're going to get this guy and we're going to get Jesus and here we come and we've got the detachment of troops and Judas is out front. He's leading these to Jesus and he is the, the, the traitor. 
And Jesus doesn't shirk. He's not like the Bruce Lee movies where the bad guy's always at the back of all the ponds. He steps out and he says, who are you looking for? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And they all fall to the ground. I would love to see that because I would rewind it, play it again. You know, I was looking for this in Mel Gibbs' movie. He missed it. He, he missed that. I think that's one of the greatest things in the night. He didn't even include it. He missed that one. I am. Whoo, and they all fall down. Can you imagine these guys? Swords like, excuse me. Wait, ouch. Ooh. What are we doing? Oh, Jesus. Now, can I ask you again, guys? Uh, who are you looking for again? Huh. Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah, I, I'm still he. Yeah, that's me. Let these guys go. You're after me. Do you see what he's doing? He's saying, I want you to declare, who are you out to get? We're out to get Jesus. Right, you're not out to get my men. You're out for me. I willingly go with you. Now it's the time. You see, in John chapter 7, the chief priests, all those leaders, they sent the detachment of troops to the temple to get Jesus. What happened there? Yeah, we're here to get Jesus. Oh, hang on a second. He's saying something. Hang on, I've never... Man, that's pretty good. That's wow. Can you really Messiah do more? Well, Messiah do more than this guy's doing? That's pretty. I've never really thought of it that way. I suppose we should arrest him. Yeah, but hang on a second. I'm still listening. And they went back and they said, Where's Jesus? Like, oh, man, have you ever heard him teach? He teaches like, like I've never heard teaching. Like, like, I mean, you guys are all right and everything, but that guy teaches and it's just like, wow, it's amazing. So here in this garden this night, all those chief priests and guys, they're coming afterwards. They're like in the background. Like, okay, you got him? You got him? We're making sure you get him this time under the cover of darkness. Witness the tenderness that we see in verse 48 of Luke 22. Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Matthew 26, 50. Friend, why have you come? You hear this reaching out? You hear this tenderness? What would you, if you were Jesus and you knew this guy's betrayed you, how would you respond? How do you respond when people offend you? Did you hear me ask you that question? How do you respond when people offend you? Like Judas or Jesus? And I think we would do well to answer that question. Because it will tell a lot of our spiritual condition. Jesus, even there, is reaching out to Judas. But look at this prayerless response of terror. 49 and 50. Those around him saw what was going to happen. They said, and Lord, shall we strike with a sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Okay, so thanks. We find out in the other Gospels. That's Peter. He doesn't even wait for the Lord's answer. He's got the sword. You said two swords are enough. And he's got the sword. Lord, should we, should we go now? Yes. All right. Jesus didn't even answer him. And he's off, you know, pirate. The way he goes. Arr! There he goes. Do you see who, he, who Peter took down? The slave. I never saw, I have never seen that until studying through this time. He didn't go after the soldier. He went after the servant, Malchus. And put yourself in Malchus' shoes. He's out there because he has to be. He's a slave. The high priest said, go, Malchus. And so he's like, okay, here I am. And whatever he's doing there, Peter's after him. Ow, my ear. And Jesus touches his ear, heals him. Can we, can we see something here? This is the response of people who are not praying people. They fly off the cuff. They vent all of their opinions it's not grounded in truth or the Word of God. Trouble. Warning. Ee, ee, ee. Peter. Look at the timing. It's divine timing. Verse 51. But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. Stop it. Knock it off, Peter. Hey, dummy. How long are you with me? You're not listening to me. Put away the sword. There's 12 legions of angels waiting for Jesus. He doesn't need Peter to fight. He doesn't call him dummy. I added that. Permit even this. Friday night, some of us gathered and we watched a missions telecast. And David Platt made this statement about the difference of Christianity and other religions in the world that are characterized by hate. He said this, 
We are not talking about people who kill out of hate. We are talking about people who die out of love. Beloved, there's a big difference there. And in the last two verses, 52 and 53, Jesus emphasizes the truth. He clarifies, who have you come for? Who's in control of this situation? Beloved, Jesus is. It's their hour of darkness, and they're following Judas. Be careful who you follow. They're following Judas, and it's their hour of darkness. But beloved, their hour is gone. Okay? The book of James says our lives last like a vapor. That's two seconds in the Michigan air. Their life is done. Their hour, power, swords, clubs, crowd, we got you, Jesus. Their hour is gone. And Easter morning, they realized we have wasted our hour. And Judas realized when he betrayed Jesus, my life, my hour is characterized by darkness, not light. And I can't handle it anymore. And he chose to end his life. Can I ask us all the question? Are you listening to me? What are you doing with your hour? Our lives are not that long, beloved. What are you doing with your hour? Because those men in the garden following Judas are in hell today if they didn't repent before they died. Nothing but regret. Nothing but sorrow. Nothing but absence of the presence of God and light. Darkness. When someone wants to be very cruel to a prisoner, they put them in, isolate, uh, in, in isolation and they leave them in darkness. They don't know when it's day. They don't know when it's night. They don't know what's in their cell. They don't know anything. They're shut out. They're in darkness. That is similar but doesn't come close to hell. And Jesus says, your hour is darkness. But the power of the light always overcomes the darkness. So we've observed the text. Now let's make application. All right, five examples of Christ. I'm not going to spend long on these. I'm going to give these to you, and you have to work them out. Okay? Number one, Jesus trusted in the sovereign plan of God. We see this all over the text. Number two, Jesus drew near to the Father in prayer. Number three, Jesus submitted to his will to the will of his Father. Number four, Jesus withstood every type and degree of temptation. And number five, Jesus revealed the goodness of God to men. Now this sermon will be online. You can follow it up. If you want to get those again, you can listen to it again. But I want us to see that. Jesus, he trusted in the sovereign plan of God. And he drew near to his Father in prayer. And he submitted. He surrendered his will. Not my will, but yours be done. And he withstood every temptation. He was sinless. And in his life and in his death and in his resurrection and in his treatment of others, Malchus, Judas, those guards, he revealed the goodness of God to men. That is Jesus. In that, we get our, our example. Okay? But Jesus did not die as an example of a martyr and therefore we should all go die. He died as a substitute for sinners. We must be theologically clear on that. Because there are, there are people who say Jesus was an example to try to reach. He's God, therefore you can't reach his example. I can't. He had to come to me and rescue me. So how do we apply this? Five corresponding responses, all right? For, for followers of Christ, number one, trust entirely in the plan of God. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. But followers of Christ, you know, here, if you're here this morning, and this is almost, I, mean, I know it's longer. We have a lot going on. We're building up to a, a key moment in this church's history of which I take very seriously. Okay? I'm, I'm approaching this very passionately, and seriously knowing what's at stake, knowing that what has come true, I've said it over, over and over to leaders, to the congregation, when we showed the meeting uh, at the business meeting, the video, people leave churches when they go through business, uh, when they go through building programs. Because it starts to get into their business, their personal business. It, it does. 
So we must be resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights. That's another song. That's another sermon. But that's important. Trust entirely in the sovereign plan of God. Number two, draw near to God on a regular basis. And how are we going to do that? We have to prioritize prayer in our lives. This will not happen by, I hope I get around to praying. This only happens when you say, I will not check Instagram until I pray. I will not check Facebook until I pray. I will not do all of the other things that are not wrong in and of themselves, except when they become idolatry to us. And they steal in temporary learning something of people, and we don't look into God's word and spend time with God. We are trading the eternal for the temporary that's passing. So we must do what Jesus did. We must prioritize prayer. I'm going to the garden. You know where to find me. And Judas did. Willingly, number three, submit your will to the will of God the Father. That means your desires, your opinions, your plans, your dreams. Here it is, God. What is your will for my life? What is your will for my children's lives? What is your plan? Let me do that. Let me buy into that and let me junk my plan when it contradicts your plan. Number four, stand against every form of temptation and fight the good fight of faith. Beloved, if we're going to stand, it's going to take some holy grit. It's going to take the power of the Holy Spirit. It's going to take us passionately understanding what is right, what is wrong, and what are we going to do for the cause of Christ and not waste this hour. Number five, Reveal the goodness of God to everyone. Matthew 5, 16, let your light sh so shine that men will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's what Jesus did. And it starts at our house. It starts at home. It includes the church and it doesn't stop till it's the other side of the planet. Reveal the goodness of God to everyone. So beloved, listen, the final days of the church... Um, there's going to be more beheadings. There's going to be more burnings. There's going to more, be more pastors thrown in jail because they speak the truth. It's not going to get better, humanly speaking. Clouds and darkness may surround many of our brothers and sisters in Christ right this very hour. But listen, no matter how dark the night may get before the coming of the Lord, the end is near. Okay? His return is a week closer than when we gathered last week. So put on Christ. This scripture is going to come up. Here's what Paul said, Romans 13. And with this, I close and leave this to us. Because some of you, you need, what do I do, pastor? What am I, what am I supposed to do? Okay. And this is, he's writing to believers. If you're a non-believer, you need to put on Christ. Repent of your sin and trust in Jesus. Not for what he can do for you, but for what he did for you, the sinner. Big difference. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, but not in strife and envy, but... In contrast to all that, that's, a, that's the characteristic of a non-believer. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Beloved, if we're going to win the battle against sexual temptation, selfishness, pride, anger, anxiety, prone to drunkenness, we're going to have to fight it's not going to go down easily. We have seen our master, Jesus. And he fought the good fight. And he finished the race. What about you? Let's stand together. Father, we are humbled by your word. We are encouraged by your word. We are strengthened by your word. We need you. We don't need any schemes or plans that are from the minds of men. We need you. And today there may be someone here who has never repented and put their faith and trust in you. May today be the day of their salvation, Lord. 
May they turn from their sin and trust in you. And I pray for this congregation of believers that we will humbly examine this hour, this night of the Lord's betrayal, and we will live the rest of our lives humbled, thankful for what you did for us, Jesus. And may our lives, may we live our lives to loudly make much of Christ from this point forward. In Jesus' great name I pray, amen.